to talk about the future of psychiatry. And I want to actually tell you something. People with serious mental health disorders die, on average, 20 years younger than the rest of us. And one in five um, Americans in any given year will have a mental health condition. The bottom line is that mental health and psychiatry are critical to the well-being of the nation. So I want to talk to you about the future of psychiatry, and part of that is that we're dealing with the brain, the most complex structure in the universe, and the intersection of the brain alongside the mind and the human body. And what we're seeing is transformational change in the neurosciences and data science, and the fusion of both of these disciplines will herald unprecedented change in terms of the research that we conduct, the impact of that research on our clinical populations, and more broadly, wellness amongst the community. So let's think about the landscape of psychiatry, and this is something that's changing dramatically. So mental health is a spectrum, and we may often focus on severe mental illness, but Many of us who are deemed healthy or asymptomatic by normal standards may also do many things to improve our mental health. Is mental health important? Absolutely. Depression is the leading cause of disability in the world. And there's many risk factors that contribute to depression. Things that we're all looking at. Obesity, smoking, diet, exercise. And in all these things, mental health is linked to physical health. Mental, these, these factors are actually driving chronic healthcare costs across all these conditions, like diabetes and coronary artery disease. Neuropsychiatric disorders as a group is the biggest cause of disability in the US as a cluster. That's excluding self-harm and self-injury. The landscape is changing. Google hired the head of the National Institute of Mental Health uh, this month to work with their life sciences division. Mobile medical app downloads continue to exponentially grow year by year. And we have initiatives like the Brain Initiative, public and private initiatives funded to further understand the brain. By hiring the head of the National Institute of Mental Health, Google and other technology companies are sending us a message. And that message is that they believe that technology is going to cause a transformational impact in how we deliver mental health care. And the fact is that people want these technologies. The patients that we see want to be empowered. They're already using smartphones. They already have these sensors in their pockets. And they want to use them, and research is showing that. So let's go beyond just simple apps and look at the entire landscape. We are seeing truly dramatic changes not only in what's happening in the landscape, but also the size. We're seeing things like provider platforms, Valera Health, Ginger IO, Lyra Health coming in, transforming the system. We're seeing big data and machine learning. We're seeing telemedicine, a huge market full of potential. And we're seeing newer wearables. We mentioned Muse and Think today, some of the work we're doing at BrainPower to empower children with autism using smart glasses. The White House Brain Initiative. $300 million of private and public funding to help us understand the brain and understand psychiatric illness. This map explains why technology is so essential, because every single area in blue on this map is where there are zero, zero child psychiatrists for every 100,000 children and adolescents. This tells you that humans are simply not enough to deliver the mental health care that we need. So, what are we going to do? What's on the agenda? What are the game changers? And here they are. Brain stimulation, neuroimaging, genetics, informatics and digital mental health, understanding and breaking down the silos between mind and body, and a personal interest of mind is neuroinflammation. These are technologies that are going to empower the next line of research and develop clinical solutions that are going to be better for our patients. So I'm a psychiatrist, I practice clinically, and what do I do? I listen to patients, I observe their behaviors, I listen to their relatives, and what am I, what am I looking for? 
I'm looking at specific changes, behavioral changes, sleep and appetite, things like uh, speech and thoughts, changes in digital and other behaviors. And the thing is, all of these different things we can monitor by using smartphone technologies and other sensors. And Valera Health, for example, a startup by one of my colleagues at Harvard, again, is looking to preempt and detect deterioration via sensors in mental health populations so we can intervene early and have impact. And we know it's not just phones, it's our eye movement. Eye movement abnormalities have been identified in conditions like schizophrenia, in conditions like autism. For example, in autism, many people struggle to make eye contact. They struggle to look at the central part of the face where so much socially salient data is being transmitted. And new technologies are enabling us to diagnose autism as early as 18 months using eye tracking solutions. So this stuff is coming and it's on the horizon. Can we predict suicide? Suicide is a top five killer um, in people aged 10 to 54. That's a lot of people in this room. And new biomarkers and new research is showing that we can predict who's likely to develop suicidal thoughts based on things like immune and inflammatory markers. It's kind of a little bit the same, some of the research coming out for schizophrenia. Those people are high risk. Who's actually going to develop schizophrenia? There's some blood markers that are coming out. Again, a lot of immune and inflammatory changes helping us to predict this with 90% plus accuracy. These things are coming to clinical practice. Not quite there yet, but they're coming. Neuroinformatics research. Combination of genetics and neuroscience and informatics is helping us to understand that these conditions that present very differently in person may actually share much of their genetic um, underpinnings. In this particular study, 15 different genes were identified across five different major psychiatric disorders. Speech patterns may be very different amongst different mental health uh, conditions, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. If we know they're different, we can use computer algorithms not only to detect those conditions, but to actually put together a model that helps us to predict who will get a condition like schizophrenia from high-risk populations. Neuroimaging is helping us to identify, this, this is just, just out this month, identify who's healthy and who's high-risk and who's got schizophrenia in terms of inflammatory changes in their brain, microglial activation. We've talked a bit about the microbiome, but it won't be complete unless I mention the microbiome is also a big deal. The chemicals that are released by um, the microbiome, inflammatory cytokines and uh, neurotransmitter precursors, impact mood and behavior. And people are investigating this in mental health. So what are the innovations on the agenda? We have avatars, we have digital um, therapists that are able to look at us, analyze our speech, analyze our body movements, and respond to us much like a human trying to emotionally connect with us, filling the gap between, um, because of the lack of human providers. We have um, X squared AI labs developing tests. This is at the Singularity Accelerator. This is stuff that's happening at Singularity. And developing an AI tool to bridge the gap between patient and their therapist, intervening and using artificial intelligence. Some of the things that we're doing at BrainPower, developing smart glass solutions to teach children with autism critical social and cognitive skills. This is a video from our Boston Research Lab. 200 children have undergone beta testing, helping them in real time, heads up, hands free, interact with their loved ones and learn these crucial life skills. As you can see, Sean's doing a remarkable job of racking up these points and in real time with his mother engaging on demand, and they can use it any time they want in the privacy of their own homes. Psychiatry may also be the first field of medicine to get the first digital medicine. And what do I mean by digital medicine? Let me clarify. An antipsychotic with a sensor that's built in. And this sensor becomes activated when it's in the stomach and sends important patient metrics and a time print to the patient, and also can, that could be shared with their clinician. Tackling the issue of adher adherence, which is huge in mental, especially with more severe conditions and illnesses. And virtual reality. This is a big deal. Costs are decreasing, the amount of research is increasing, and this is particularly pertinent. It's Veterans Day. Many of our, the veterans I've treated from Iraq and Afghanistan, they've had some kind of exposure to uh, virtual reality in research studies. And this is a hugely beneficial field that will only continue to develop further. 
We talk about a lot about wearables, and let's think about that from a developmental perspective. So this is some uh, work being done at UC Davis in terms of actually using clothing and actually using things that are fun for children to engage in, because we have to also think developmentally about a lot of these conditions. The needs of children, they're not just small adults. The concept of asynchronous telepsychiatry. We hear a lot about tele, um, telehealth and telemedicine. What happens if it's asynchronous? So a psychiatrist will review a lot of interviews at the end of the day, similar to what a radiologist would do with scans. But these interviews may be done and enhanced by computer learning and emotion analysis. And this is some of the work being done by my colleague Steve Chan at UC Davis. This can have major cost uh, savings and improvements in terms of accessibility. And what does the future look like? We've talked a lot about brain-machine interfaces and technologies. We readily accept technologies and implantables for the heart, pacemakers. So what does it look like if we have a brain pacemaker, a piece of technology that helps us overcome mental illness? The first image actually shows um, some of the work being done at Mass General, and this is with a $30 million uh, research grant by DARPA to develop implantable brain technologies that will help with psychiatric illness. The second picture you see is actually some primate research, and this, actually, uh, this particular paper looked at networking primate brains together in a brain net, and these brains can collaboratively solve problems. In this case, it was a, it was a motor task that they had to do, a virtual motor task. But it raises the question, in the future, Will we have brain networks connected together for people? Can we overcome not just motor issues, but cognitive and emotional issues? There's a lot of ethical implications, but a lot of this is up and coming. So I'd like to thank my colleagues at um, MIT, Harvard, UC Davis, and Mass General, the work I do at BrainPower, and uh, thank you for your time. I'd love to collaborate and talk to you about developmental approaches to mental health, mental health in general, and I collaborate with a great deal of people at Signalarity and across the country. So thank you very much for your time.